Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much to the Oxford Union. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. I'm also delighted to be back in Oxford. I realized, um, unfortunately, that I was here approximately 20 years ago. Um, in fact, I arrived in Oxford 20 years ago where I completed my PhD in economics. It's a great privilege for me to be here and to be on the same dais that many people, eminent scholars and uh, scientists and artists, have um, been able to spend time here at Oxford over the years. And in preparing, I noticed with great humility that over the multiple centuries, we've actually hosted such extraordinary figures such as Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Nelson Mandela, and uh, Mother Teresa. This space has been a long proving ground for new and thought-provoking ideas that don't shy away from difficult questions, but rather embrace them. That is the spirit in which I've come here today. What is the price of freedom? At the core of liberal ideology is this fundamental belief, a bedrock assumption that whatever the time, whatever the place, the answer is always more freedom rather than less. In fact, Western thought has long held, for instance, that free markets and free people are the fundamental assumption in order to create economic growth. Moreover, there's a general assumption in Western thinking that in order for us to create economic growth, a prerequisite is democracy and freedom. The problem, of course, is that parts of the world in recent times have grown richer and they aren't necessarily the ones that where we have seen much more freedom, as China can attest. But China aside, there is another aspect of our infatuation for freedom that is rarely attended to. Freedom is not costless. Individual freedoms impose steep costs on government, on society, and ultimately on economic growth. And yet the tension and trade-off between individual freedom and societal costs very often go unspoken. In fact, it's rather considered taboo. However, in this era of slow and slowing economic growth, we must summon the courage to speak up on this issue and ask ourselves, should we limit individual freedoms in the interest of broader societal progress? Today, I will explore this thought-provoking question. In so doing, first I'm going to argue that economic growth is the defining challenge of our time. I will then proceed to offer three thought experiments that illustrate the societal costs that are imposed on our societies and life because of individual freedom. In so doing, I will suggest that refining freedom might actually safeguard global prosperity in the years and the decades to come. But before I go on, let me acknowledge on the outset that some of you in this room might find this line of inquiry quite jarring, in fact, downright objectionable. And for good reason. People who were born or educated in the West tend to fetishize individual freedom. How could we not? When actually it's the core and it's deeply held belief in the culture. And yet history shows that even in Western society, individual freedoms are not as sacrosanct as we might imagine. For example, during the American Civil War in the 1840s, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, the fundamental right that guarantees every citizen a fair trial. For years, Lincoln wielded the unchecked power to arrest anyone he wanted for any reason or indeed for no reason at all. And right here in Britain during World War II, Winston Churchill arrested British citizens suspected of aiding and abetting the Nazis without any charges or trials. Lincoln and Churchill are two of the greatest advocates for liberty in the history of Western civilization, and yet they both suspended the very most basic civil liberty, the right to due process, when cataclysmic wars threatened their country's very existence. In this sense, they were facing existential crises. Of course, this is 2017, it's not 1841 or 1939, and we aren't staring down Nazi rifle, rifles or, or fighting uh, the, end, the end of the abomination of slavery. However, I put it to you today that nevertheless we are facing an existential crisis of a different sort. 
In fact, our crisis is a slow motion crisis resulting from an intricate web of social and economic challenges that we face today. Taken together, these challenges form a very different, but no less profound, existential threat in the 21st century. Our ability to create and sustain economic growth is the defining crisis of our lives. With economic growth, societies unlock virtuous cycles of opportunity, upward mobility, and rising living standards. Without it, societies contract and atrophy. This is not a matter of arcane economic indices or abstract measures of prosperity. Growth matters powerfully for the ordinary citizen. When it wanes, the sick go untreated, the, hungry, the, the young go uneducated, and the hungry go unfed. Without economic growth, global predicaments such as environmental degradation and resource scarcity become more acute. Conversely, strong economic growth is the key to solving some of the most critical and seemingly intractable uh, challenges that the world faces today, from climate change to global pandemics to the threat of radicalized terror groups. For people who are fortunate enough to live in prosperous countries, it may be hard to see how it is that economic growth is in a state of existential crisis. But if we look carefully, we can see the storm clouds on the horizon. In the coming years, workforce automation threatens to create a massive jobless underclass of people who are not trained or skilled to compete in a technology world. All the while, the unparalleled population boom of the 21st century promises more people will be competing for fewer natural resources. Meanwhile, the widening income inequality that plagues developed countries today could only get worse, at the same time as mounting debt at the sovereign and consumer level continues to reach dangerously unstable levels. And of course, productivity, that key engine for economic growth, continues to decline. These overlapping crises pose unprecedented danger to economic growth, and what threatens growth almost certainly threatens every facet of society. To meet this threat, we must take a long, hard look at all the forces that constrain growth, including personal freedoms that we, pri we prize so much above all else. Allow me, please, to offer three thought experiments that highlight this tension at the very core, which is the tension between individual freedom and societal costs. Now, to be absolutely clear, these thought experiments are not meant to be prescriptive, but rather illustrative. They are designed to motivate our thinking and to inspire a broader debate as we tackle the economic growth malaise that we face today. The first of these thought experiments concerns obesity. Today, in the first time in recorded history, the number of overweight and obese people around the world has overtaken the number of people who are underfed and malnourished, with estimates topping a billion people around the world who are considered obese or overweight. This situation creates massive economic imbalances and inflates healthcare costs everywhere. In the United States alone, more than two thirds of the population, over 66% 60 of adults, are considered overweight or obese. In fact, the global consulting firm McKinsey forecasts that by 2065, obesity will contribute to the fact that United States healthcare costs will represent 100% of the country's GDP, with Japan and Europe's costs following suit soon after. Now, at a very fundamental level, freedom is about choice. And the individual choice to consume translates into, into, into enormous healthcare costs for society at large. Clearly, these ballooning costs of obesity and diabetes and other diseases related to, to food are a massive drag on economic growth. Of course, there are many factors that contribute to obesity, from genetics to geography, but because we prioritize individual freedom, people are allowed and indeed encouraged to consume as much as they like. Moreover, in Europe and America, the primacy of individual freedom distorts public policy 
creating a vicious cycle that becomes harder and harder to break. Here's how it works. Politicians who want to win votes, particularly in key farming states, promise huge subsidies on crops like corn. The resulting relatively cheap corn makes it easier for food companies to sell and to produce food and food substances and drinks that are actually quite unhealthy. More and more consumers, particularly the poor, who cannot afford healthier food, come to rely on these staples for their daily meals, driving obesity figures even higher. When the government's marginal dollar of spending goes towards mounting medical bills rather than infrastructure or education, it constrains economic growth. And ironically, that lower growth might get the same subsidy-loving politicians voted out of office, forcing them to make even more outlandish promises to get elected. Meanwhile, any official who tries to remove these perverse subsidies or regulate overconsumption is branded an enemy of freedom. As you can see, when we prioritize individual freedom above all else, it can have very real consequences on the health of a population, on the integrity of our political systems, and ultimately on the growth of the global economy. Sometimes the tension between individual freedom and society's costs and growth is evident in personal choices like the food we eat on a day-to-day -day basis. Other times, it takes the form of planet-wide trends. The second thought experiment I'd like to share with you today relates perhaps to the most alarming of these trends, the skyrocketing global population. Population growth promises to be one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. It took roughly 125 years to go from two to three billion people on the planet. Yet it's taken just around 50 years for the global population to go from 3 billion people in the 1960s to over 7.5 billion people on the planet today. India's population alone is growing by approximately 1 million people a month. And UN forecasters and demographers estimate that the global population will continue to grow apace until it reaches 11 billion people in the year 2100. Our schools and hospitals are already struggling to keep pace with this explosive population growth, and it could only get worse. Of course, there are a range of issues why people around the world are having so many children, particularly in the poorest communities and countries. High infant mortality, the need for manual labor in subsistence communities, subsistence farming communities, and the prospect of an aging population that requires care have all played a role in the ballooning global population. But no matter the cause, the exponential population growth is weighing down on economic growth prospects. Setting aside the moral and practical considerations, economic theory tells us that there are three ways in order to address such a tragedy of the common challenge. One is through taxation, second is through regulation, and the third is through privatization of costs. But in a world that prizes freedom above all else, we will never be able to implement any of these in order to measure or to curb population growth and, and, ultimately, um, and ultimately limit supplies of food and raw material will not be able to keep up. In the two thought experiments I've shared with you thus far, economic growth is constrained by individual freedom. But in the third and final example that I present to you now, economic growth is constrained by political the, the political manifestation of individual freedom, which is the right to vote. In most democracies, almost every adult citizen enjoys the right to vote, but no one Absolutely no one bears the responsibility for how they vote and whether it's ultimately in the best interest of society as a whole. Voting decisions are guided neither by strict rules of evidence nor by common facts. A voter is free to vote for or against any candidate based on purely subjective reasons. And because ballots are secret, voter choices are subject to no scrutiny. The result 
is that a voting process lacks any mechanism to properly assess policies and candidates, especially with voters increasingly and dangerously influenced by false information. In the end, voters often cast ballots against the interests of the nation and society as a whole. Instead of this free-for-all approach to political voting, imagine if the voting system looked more like a jury system, where rules of evidence are clearly established, false or irrelevant information is immediately flagged and discarded, and the decision process is peer-based and holds us all mutually accountable. The jury system may have its flaws, but at the very least, jurors' decisions are informed by a set of common facts and deliberations are open, making it difficult for any one person to vote purely based on their personal biases and their subjective opinions. These three thought experiments are, meant to are not meant to suggest specific solutions, nor are obesity, population growth, and voting the only examples of how individual freedoms hamstring economic growth or are manifesting themselves as societal costs. But together, I hope they illustrate the very real consequences that freedom can have on economies, societies, and ultimately on human progress as a whole. As I have said before, the notion of ceding individual liberties in pursuit of broader societal gains might actually seem to some as an abomination. Indeed, if this were some other time or place, the question at the center of my presentation today might be immediately rejected. But to avoid these difficult questions simply because they are difficult is to deny reality. And we must not shy away from difficult debate nor seek only knowledge that confirms our prejudices. The purpose of debate is to hone our thinking, expand our perspectives, and to find the best solutions for our greatest challenges. In an era of ever slowing economic growth and structural challenges that erode the prospect of future growth, assessing how certain individual freedoms impact economic growth must be on the agenda. To be clear, I am not suggesting that we jettison freedom, and I'm not suggesting that we throw out democracy. I am suggesting that we might refine certain individual freedoms before society can no longer bear the cost. I hasten to add that that day may arrive sooner than we think. After all, it was just 20 years ago that I arrived here at Oxford as a PhD student in 1997. The internet had just come into existence. The United States was enjoying the longest peacetime economic expansion in its history. The Cold War had been won. The European Union's ranks were swelling and globalization and free trade were widely embraced by both sides of the political aisle. In the 20 years since I first came to Oxford, the world has gone from embracing globalization to fearing it. From the end of the Cold War to an endless global war and terror. The European Union, which not long ago seemed like the future of a continent, is now struggling to justify itself. And the West is being destabilized by a wave of nationalism. Another 20 years from now, in 2037, there will be nearly 9 billion people living on Earth. Climate change will have permanently altered the face of our planet, and new technologies will have changed our lives, in a way, lives and workplaces in a way that we cannot even imagine. I fully believe that in 20 years' time, the questions that I have raised today will be firmly entrenched in the mainstream of economic and political debate. Which brings us full circle to this extraordinary institution. The Oxford Union is one of the great crucibles for new ideas, a place where we come to explore and refine our own ideals and debate the questions that will shape our future. And while the questions we face today constitute an existential threat, we have conquered existential threats before. Indeed, discussions in rooms like this one have shaped our successful response to some of the greatest crises that have, humanity has had to confront. I very much hope, with your support, that we can continue to advance that effort today. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Moyo. I'm uh, conscious that you have to jet off to New York very soon. So um, if you would like to um, ask Dr. Moyo a question, please put your hand up, wait for the microphone to reach you, and state your point as briefly as possible. Can we go to the lady at the end of that row there in the middle? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your really insightful speech. Um, you mentioned uh, quite a few points regarding individual freedom. I was wondering what your opinion was about um, the recent clampdown on press freedom and, op and on opposition parties in your home country. In Zambia. In my own com in home Zam country. In Zambia, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to do you. that because then I would be, be barred from going back home. So. Um, <laughs> But press freedom, so uh, you know, I think it's really important for me to underscore that I am pro-freedom, but I think it's also important, and I hopefully that was clear, I, I'm not sort of uh, advocating that uh, we, should be, uh, we should not have freedom. What I am um, concerned about is that without a clear understanding of what the consequences of freedom are, we may end up in a, in a corner where we have societal costs dominating um, to such an extent that we have a, a reduction in growth. I am very much pro press freedom. Um, I do worry a lot, like I think many people in this room, that there is a schism now in terms of how information that should be reported is now very opinion based and actually has led to this um, really um, stretched spectrum between whether you read left-leaning left newspapers versus right-leaning newspapers and watch shows or television that uh, are, um, uh, that are uh, uh, sort of, uh, I was going to say tainted, but that's probably not the right word, were actually influenced by left or right-wing uh, wing, um, perspective. So press freedom is critically important, but I think people have to be objective because there are, there's a lot more nuance and judgment needed. Um, we are, we're smart people, you're here at, at Oxford, um, you know, I think that we deserve, as, as citizens, we deserve um, better reporting, better information. And uh, I, I do worry quite a bit that we now live in a world where there's um, far too much um, uh, opinion that is influencing um, politics, but also influencing our ability to address public policy issues. Okay, yeah, let's go to the hand there, just two rows in front of you. Great, thank you. Hi, um, so you write quite persuasively in Dead Aid about the importance of trade as an alternative to foreign aid. I was wondering if, if you have any thoughts on if there's a place for protectionism for developing countries to kind of keep out Western goods flooding into the market and what you think the conditions and likelihoods around that are. So I am quite concerned about the um, general uh, direction of public policy around trade. Um, as I mentioned in the speech, when I was a student here, there was a lot of momentum about uh, globalization and um, free trade. I think that is a, it has been proven to be a critical piece of long-term economic success. And you know, in periods of, in past, with during Smoot-Hawley in the United States where there were massive tariffs, we know what the consequences of that type of, protection of protectionism were and what they might be in terms of unemployment, in terms of slowing down economic growth and ultimately um, creating a, a reduction in living standards. So I am very much pro um, trade pro globalization, but I'm also not so naive as to not understand that we are um, facing a situation where it has not the benefits of that have not been widely spread, and so there are some considerations that we need to think about with respect to um, emerging countries. As you may be aware, 75% of global GDP, roughly 75%, is now from the emerging markets. 90% of the world's population is in the emerging markets. Um, from my vantage point and from my sense Sensibilities. I think that we have, I certainly have gained um, from seeing not just ideas, but also trade as well as um, capital flow moving across borders as well as people. And I, I would hope that we can continue to pursue that type of a frame. But obviously, with the um, advent of the financial crisis and in the wake of um, what, the, what the consequences of the financial crisis have been, I think there's a lot of skepticism both in developed and developing countries about how much trade um, openness can actually deliver. And I think that's where we really need to be front footed. We need to make the case that, uh, that trade is a good thing um, there, not just in theory in the economics textbooks, but in a practical way, it can improve people's lives. Um, but we also have to be sensitive enough to address a very valid concern that not all boats have been lifted, so to speak, as was promised under the Washington consensus. Great, let's have another question. Okay, uh, yeah, the hand at the very back on that side. Yeah. 
You mentioned that lack of economic growth would have negative impacts on climate change, but it also seems like economic growth as being heavily dependent on fossil fuels is the reason why we have climate change in the first place. So in that statement, are you assuming that, that if we lack economic growth, we won't implement new uh, sustainable energy technologies? Um, could you clarify? So I should, I, I, despite the, perhaps the tone of my speech, I'm an eternal optimist. I actually think that uh, we're living at an a age, and I look to you guys, because you are you know, much younger than I am, you're, you're still students here. I, I think that we have to rely on innovation and technology to actually solve some of these really big challenges that we're facing. Um, you know, I didn't stress it enough in terms of population growth, for example. I mean, this is, this, what, the population growth that we're experiencing right now is incredibly unique. It has never happened, and the speed of population growth has never happened in history or prehistory, and it will never happen happen again um, after 2100 when the world's population plateaus out. Um, the issues around climate change have definitely become much more severe and much more problematic in recent years as there's been much more industrialization as the population has grown, etc. So I am optimistic that we can find solutions, but I don't think it's from wishing the solutions away. Um, I come from a, a very poor country, one of the poorest countries in the world, Zambia. And um, you know, it's very hard to, do the, to think about the trade-offs between people's living and actually their ability to actually create opportunities for them to survive food and sustainability for their families versus the broader construct of economic and environmental um, challenges that you're talking about. So I think that there is a balance. This agenda of green growth, the um, agenda of, on uh, um, encourage, whether it's COP21 in, in Paris or the Copenhagen consensus, I think the momentum is for us not to just jettison fossil fuels, but is to find ways that are better and more efficient to deliver energy for people around the world so that we can end up in a, in a place where we're able to, to grow in a green way. So much better um, um, through innovation and through technology to be able to deliver the same unit of, of uh, energy, um, but perhaps without the, the global um, consequences and costs of degradation of the environment. Great. Uh, let's go to the hand there by the fireplace. Hi, Dr. Moyo. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us. Thank you. Uh, my question is connected to the, the previous one. Um, is uh, perpetual growth as currently understood um, truly compatible on a planet of limited resources? I guess this whole notion of green growth, is green growth uh, truly possible or is it just a contradiction in terms? Thank you very much. So another great question. I think these are the questions that public policy is grappling with right now. Um, you know, if you look back in history, in the 1700s, Malthus was talking about how population growth was so rapid. And think about what I just sa said earlier about how the, the rapidity of population growth in such recent times. And he was talking about this in the 1700s, real concern that we were basically going to end up with too many people who would not be able to sustain ourselves. The Club of Rome in the 70s also had a similar theme. So we've been able to bail ourselves out from technology advances and from progress um, in innovation. And I do think that um, one of the beauties of, of humanity is that we have continued to survive and to innovate in a way that um, does address some of the existential challenges, um, seemingly existential challenges that I, I, I mentioned in, in the speech that I delivered. So in a nutshell, I, um, what I'm saying is that um, I don't think that we're just going to sit on our laurels and not do anything about these challenges. And, th and that was part of the reason I wanted to um, make the address here. I think that you are the future. Um, I know you are the future. And therefore, it's really imperative that you understand the weight of the challenges that we're facing. The public policy um, uh, agenda, both um, in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, but also in terms of the political agenda that we relied on in the 20th century um, is no longer applicable in the 21st century. The non-state actors that now exist did not really exist, exist in the way that they do um, today. So for example, wealthy philanthropists and their role in, um, in the social sector, um, the uh, um, non-state actors like terrorist uh, gangs, it did not exist to the extent that they do today. Um, it's the way governments finance themselves. So there's a whole range of issues, including climate change, that was not one that was so, con well, con so concerning in the 20th century. But the point I was trying to underscore to you today is that the tools that we use to solve economic problems 
growth malaise or any of the other challenges that we face in the 20th century no longer apply in the 21st century. And so we do have to think more innovatively um, about how we redress everything from climate change to population growth because the world has fundamentally and structurally changed and those tools do not work anymore. Thank you. Let's have another question. Uh, yeah, let's go to that, the hand there just next to the camera yeah, within the glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I want to um, ask you more about this philosophical conception of individual liberty. It seems to me like the choices that have existed in the 20th century have been either individual liberty or communism is kind of how the argument gets framed. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe a different conception in terms of individual liberty, but also the immense interdependencies that we're beginning to see between people, um, if integrating that could lead to better outcomes. Thank you. So I really like that question. I'm spending a lot of time actually thinking about that. Um, you know, we, we, the, the notion of individual freedom is a quite a, a selfish construct. And you're right that, you know, at the other extreme, you could pick on communism, um, which is much more, very simply put, is really much more about prioritizing society over the individual. Um, but, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, if I may quote the uh, Pope Francis, uh, you know, he was talking about a capsized boat of, uh, of refugees from North Africa um, to Lampedusa a number of years ago. And he reflected upon, upon the fact that the boat capsized, um, uh, I think it was over 300 people died, including a woman who was um, seven and a half, I think seven, eight months pregnant, who actually gave birth to her child, baby boy. And the, when they found them, the child was still attached by umbilical cord. Now you might say, well, what does that have to do with individual freedom? And Pope Francis's point was that we have, we have become desensitized to the consequences of our choices here um, in terms of what it means for people elsewhere. So in that construct, he talked about this idea of the globalization of indifference, um, which I thought was a very great way of, uh, of, um, of encapsulating that horrific scene that I've just um, relayed to you. So what does it mean? Um, we have to become more sensitized to this idea of boomerang effects. So you know, many people will say, well, we were worried about all these immigrants coming to Europe or take your pick. There are about 65 million um, immigrants, uh, refugees around the world now. It's the highest number since World War II. Just to, just to explain just another uh, point about how challenging um, the world has become. But if you ask people why people are um, moving, they'll say, oh, it's because of economic challenges, the polit mainly political challenges from their countries and they're immigrating to Europe or uh, other developed countries. But there's no recognition that the failure of the political state or the economic state in those countries is actually an artifact of policies that have been made here in the West. An example would be trade policy. So you will be aware that a lot of people um, in my generation talked about the need for uh, free trade. We talked a little bit about that and globalization. On paper, it was a great idea. But in practice, you have the common agriculture policy in Europe. You have the farm subsidies in the United States that essentially lock out foreign emerging market countries from selling their produce into Europe and the United States. As a consequence of that, hundreds of millions of farmers in South America and Africa across Asia are not able to sell their goods into these markets. So the consequence for that is that the government has less revenue and politically this creates a very fractious situation in those countries. Ultimately, people make the choice to leave those countries as refugees because there's political war um, or instability and uh, economically you see an implosion of slow growth in, in many of these countries. So I think just to pick up on your, on your finer point, you're absolutely right that we do need a broader utility function away from just what the individual wants and you know, basically pursuing that without uh, or ad infinitum. But you know, I put it to you, how willing are particularly Westerners, but really globally, how willing are we to really cede the benefits of subsidies or the common agriculture policy so that we don't have the refugees. Many people don't want to move away from their homes or from their society. And so the next time we put a Band-Aid solution on the refugees and say, oh, we just need to um, give them more money, recognize that there's a public policy um, choice that has been made in the West, for example, that has real consequences uh, in the emerging markets. And when those sort of proverbial chickens come to roost, in the West, um, do think and reflect on whether that actually boils down to individual freedom. So I think it's too easy for us to 
uh, to, uh, well, I'd say easy, but I think the whole point of my, my address today was to try and force our thinking a little bit, motivate our thinking towards understanding that these individual costs do um, permeate into the political system, into public policy, with very real consequences. By the time 20 years passes, and so today if a public uh, a policy decision is made around subsidies, um, you may not see the refugees streaming over tomorrow, but in 20 years time when that public, po the policy, a politician is left office, you then see the refugees and you understand it to be something much more superficial than it really is. And so the interlinkages between what governments and policymakers are doing today in the West has real consequences for elsewhere. And I think that that's really the agenda I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward to you today. Great, we've got time for two more questions. Let's go to the hand at the very back there, Stephen. Yeah, inside, very back. Hi, Dr. Moya, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna know if you have any suggestions of any solutions or measures we could put in place now to solve A, um, the issue of trying to make the media and politics more objective and be trying to halt the uh, issue of growing populations? That's your job. I'm only here to deliver the challenges. You, you guys have to, you have more time on the planet left than I do. Um, so it's again, something I spend a lot of time thinking about. I think in terms of the media, the, um, the idea of a national, subsidized national media outlet in concept is a good one. So the, what BBC was originally intended to do, um, but you would have to defend that to make sure that it's actually not tainted. Um, I think that the, uh, there, there's a fine line between free press, which I was asked about and I, I would defend to, uh, to my death, um, but also to, uh, there's, there's a fine line between that and a lack of responsibility in terms of the uh, fourth estate and what the role of the media uh, actually is um, in terms of defending and, and, and uh, encouraging political discourse and democracy. So, you know, that's, that would be one example. In terms of population growth, I did touch on these. I, you know, as I mentioned, this is a classic tragedy of the commons type of, uh, of challenge. And I gave you a few others. Tragedy of the commons is basically this very simple idea that if everybody does what they want to do, um, ultimately we all suffer. And I, I think the original one was about uh, grazing animals they can, if we allowed them to graze it all they want in a little patch of land, eventually um, they would eat up everything, all the grass, they would die, and then we would die because we wouldn't have any animals to eat. Um, so what I've described is a tragedy of the commons case and the, the literature, the economic literature argues that tragedy of the commons can only be dealt with in three ways. Either you tax um, people, so in, my, in the story I just gave you, you would tax the farmers so that they would have to pay a lot extra money to invest in growing the grass again. Um, you, would e you could privatize, so you would allow people to buy a patch of the land and they would have to pay a certain amount um, to the government or uh, you, could, uh, you could regulate. Now, this, my whole point is that regulation in terms of population growth has manifested itself in places like India where they, uh, where there was a policy of castration in the 1970s or in the one-child policy in China. But that is completely antithetical to Western ideas and ideals around individual freedom. People find, found it so abhorrent that um, these two countries, which are the largest populations in the world, over a billion people, um, would impose that type of regulation on their populations. And so, I, I mean, that one I, I really leave to you. I, you know, I think that it's an interesting um, challenge that I leave with you in terms of what sorts of public policy initiatives could you come up with to, um, to really help address uh, what is a very complicated issue. And I, I'm also, just to underscore, I, I think that it's more complicated by the fact that the reason people are not are having this many children is not just because they, uh, they don't have access to contraception, for example. It's, be it's much more complicated. It's about long-term pensions, it's about infant mortality. So it is a public policy challenge. And uh, you know, I urge you guys to think about that very strategically because you're the people who in the years to come will have to grapple with this. Thank you. Let's take one final question. Uh, yeah, just you over there. 
You just spoke about um, the tragedy of the commons and the three ways that you could possibly um, respond to that. Isn't one possible way education, so through giving people more awareness of these issues, um, they could hopefully, through their free will, choose the options that, that will then, in return, give society freedom as well? So it's brilliant. I didn't put it on there because um, I viewed my presence here as basically doing what you just said. Um, my hope is that you're not gonna have burgers and uh, beers after you leave here because you'll be thinking about the broader societal costs that you're imposing on society. Um, no, don't be that extreme. But, but the point just being, um, you're absolutely right, um, but ultimately your question actually feeds into the question that came up over here because a lot of the time it's not that we don't know what we should do for individual, um, individual utility. It's just that we choose to do something differently. So, you know, I, I think I'd be hard pressed to ask people in this room if they think, they, 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 I'm sure everyone in this room knows eating well and sleeping a lot and, you know, watching what you eat and getting exercise is good for us. But how many of us do that on a regular basis? How many of us actually, you know, how many of us actually choose, make decisions all the time that are antithetical to our health? And yet we have the choice to make different decisions. And so you're right, I can, I can sit here and educate as much as possible. Um, my job here is done in many ways because I've planted this in your minds and maybe today it will matter and maybe in 10 years you won't really care. But hopefully you'll think about these issues and um, you know, I hope that you'll have the debate amongst yourselves but with your family members and your friends. And I'm not claiming that these are isu easy issues but they nevertheless are massive costs and you don't have to believe me, you can go and look at the government reports on the costs that are being um, currently, uh, um, the way, weighing down on economic growth today and, and for forecasts tomorrow. So um, I'll leave it with you. Well, thank you for coming here to plot the seeds for this conversation. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. So if you could please remain seated while the speaker leaves the room. Join me in thanking Dr. Moyo for coming here one last time.